Hi, Dr. Pad here, looking at logistic functions. Logistic functions are really good to uh, demonstrate uh, the spread of uh, diseases, your germs, and also for gossip. So if you're doing any marketing, this is a very important uh, function for you because it does describe how the spread of information, how it happens. Okay, so let's take a look at things and, and let's kind of think about this for a minute. How does uh, germs and information spread in terms of the people and the population? Okay, and so basically what you have is you have uh, a health, uh, you know, a healthy person gets infected and then basically starts uh, meeting with people, talking with people, you know, interacting and starts spreading it to a couple people and then it start, they start spreading it. And same thing with information, you know, one person experiments with the product, starts telling their friends, and then their friends start telling friends, and then those people start telling other people. And so then what happens is, at the beginning, when we have a, a disease or we have information, only a few people know about it. And it spreads, it's starting to spread, but it's still within a limited population. And then what happens once we start getting to a point, basically this spreading just starts spreading like crazy. So then we have basically a very steep rise in the people who are infected or the people who know about the, uh, the information about the product. And then after a while, it starts to level off. It starts to slow down. The spread does. The reason being is because you have a market share, you have a certain population. They basically get to the point where everybody's got it or the people who are isolated. Isolated, they're the ones who don't catch the disease. They're the ones who don't get the information. So for most of the population, we had a quick rise to it, and then uh, we start leveling off. So we're looking at a situation where it's not steep at the beginning, steep in the middle when it starts spreading like crazy, and then levels off at the end. So that's the kind of the situation we're talking about here. And it just so happens that a logistic curve here, the one on the right side of this screen, the logistic is what we're looking at. We're looking at a situation where it is a uh, uh, kind of like an exponential growth. We've got a percentage growth here, kind of level at the beginning. And then it gets steeper and steeper in the middle. And then what happens is we start leveling off. Just a few people know about it. A few people are infected. They start spreading it. And then the spreading of the disease, the spread of the information just grows phenomenally. And then after the population, basically, most of the people get it. Then it's the spread is very, very slow because we're looking at isolated people. And so what we have here is we have a comparison between exponential logistics. An exponential doesn't worry about the population size. It just basically grows at the same rate, the same percentage rate. And so that's what an exponential does. Just keeps on getting steeper and steeper and steeper. That's basically uh, not a situation we have for marketing into diseases because we do have a population size. Either, you know, we got 100% of the population, 100% of the market share. There's a cap that we have. And when we have a cap, we have a ceiling, then we're talking logistics. Logistic is like an exponential at the beginning, and then basically it's got to level off after that. So it is exponential-like, but then because of our ceiling, it converts from an exponential into this kind of logistics curve where it begins to level off at that ceiling point. So that's the main difference between exponential and logistic. The beginning, about the same, but it's about the second half of the graph. That's where we're seeing a main difference between the two. Our money grows exponentially because there's no ceiling to it. But our logistic curve does have a ceiling. Okay, so another business application that you might see this is market shares. And when we're talking about market shares, we're looking at who the people are in the in in that market. So usually you have basically innovators. These are the people that are out there. They're just basically exploring. These are the explorers of our technology. They're ready to use the newest technology. So when there's an iPhone 4, they're in line for the iPhone 5. And so those kind of things. So your, your innovators are really the ones who are in the line. They're getting those products right when they come out. Early adopters, they're kind of like the same way. They're they're not as motivated, so maybe they don't wait in line, but they basically wait till the next day and they'll buy that product. So they're they're aware of the new stuff that comes out. And then basically you've got um, you know, uh the next phase of a group of people, early majority 
that you know they're not going to be exploring it they're going to kind of wait and see if that product is good and if that technology is good then they're going to adopt it somewhat early than most of the population but they're kind of wait and seers and then you've got the late majority and the laggards. The laggards, they're really, they're hard pressed. Basically, they're gonna, they're gonna buy that when VCRs are no longer available, you know? And so then what happens is then they'll start changing the DVDs or, um, Blu-ray. But they're only gonna do that when basically everything, uh, their other options are just basically discontinued. The late majority, they're, they're also in the same way. They're gonna basically use their technology for as long as possible until it starts to be inconvenient. Yet. Kind of different than the laggards. Laggards are basically, they're waiting until the very end. Late majority, they're kind of using their product as long as possible. And so that's what we got. Same thing with cars. There are people out there that are buying the newest cars and things like that. And so that's what you're seeing in the, the first part of this. New car people. And, but then you've got... Uh, the late majority, they're the people that are like using their cars for, you know, the, the 10 years or things like this, where innovators and early adopters, they're more like the lease people. They lease their cars for the, the quick four years kind of thing, or maybe two or three years, and then they're looking for the new model or a, a new brand. And so they're uh, they're really looking out there. They're changing a lot. Whereas the second half of this group here, they're waiting for things to happen. They're waiting for their car to break down. They're waiting for a really good buy on something like that. And so that's your main difference there. That, but it follows this nice exponential growth in terms of 100% of the population there or your market share. And um, does, a, does a product really get 100% of the market share? So this, this may be unrealistic in terms that it gets to 100%. Maybe what we're looking at is may get to 75%, but geez, 75% of your market share is tremendous. So usually this graph in terms of market share is uh, logistics wise, but it's a little bit flat it doesn't go as high in most markets so we're just kind of really stretching it for the hundred percent just to kind of make that point all right and so now let's look at the basics of this graph here we, we see how we can use it now let's look at the, at the actual model itself so like I was talking about once again the early part of this is a rapid growth what we're looking at is an exponential like model right here not as steep as a true exponential uh, but basically it does have that shape and then what happens is the uh, growth starts to level off because it's harder to convince this second half of the people to actually buy the product in that way so what we're looking here is a leveling off thing so that's the difference between an exponential logistics and there's a key point some kind of cool relationships uh, that's the point of maximum growth okay so your your return rate there that's the this is the point of diminishing returns because from this point on your graph is not as steep as was earlier and you got y equals c is your ceiling. So think of c as your ceiling. That's your leveling off point. And here's your formula that we have. This is your basic uh, logistics. And some cool key points. That point of maximum growth, if you want, a nice little formula. That's x equals ln a over r. And we can do some algebra to show that. And um, so there, there's a point that we can do that. And then basically the y value is halfway up the ceiling. So this point of maximum growth has this cool relationship. It's halfway vertically to the ceiling. That's where your maximum growth occurs. And then if you take this c over 2 and you plug it in for y and then do all the algebra to solve for t or x here, that could be a t or an x, then what happens is that's where the ln a over r occurs. So that's just basically doing the algebra to get that point. Now, you might be looking at this formula here, and you're looking at that negative value there. Well, that negative, why is it there? Well, there's uh, some differential aspects to this. When we do derivatives in a business calculus class, in the calculus class, we'll look at this, and we'll kind of show why the negative has to be there. But another way to look at this without doing calculus is to kind of analyze this formula. What happens here? So when as time goes on, as t gets bigger, as x gets bigger, what's going to happen to this portion of the thing? Well, because this is a negative power, as time gets larger, this means this e thing is, is really a fraction. This part right here is going to get smaller because it's technically a fraction because of the negative power. This goes to zero as time gets bigger. 
a is a number, so a times 0 is going to be uh, basically 0. And so we end up with c over 1, we end up with c. So we need this thing to be negative in order for this part of it to go to 0. If this part did not go to 0, then that would make the denominator huge when time gets large, as time goes by. The denominator would get large if this was a positive exponent. And if the denominator gets large, then the fraction would go to 0. And so all our things would be going to 0, would level off to 0. That would be a case if we had a decreasing situation where basically we're flipping this graph. So it would be up here at the ceiling, then it would come down and level off to 0. So if you want a decreasing situation, it's opposite. You actually want a positive here for an increasing situation. You want this to be negative. So that's just a little bit of background for that formula. The C value, that's always our ceiling. So that's basically all set up for us. And this A value, think of it as an adjustment to get your starting value the right level. Okay, so this right, this A value is really a number that we need to get our uh, initial value at the right spot. I'm not saying it's the initial value. It's a number that we'll calculate to get our initial value. Because when you plug in 0 for t here, this turns to be 1. And you're left with c over 1 plus a as the value when you get at time 0. So that's why a is not the initial value. It's more like an adjustment factor to get that initial value. Uh, things that when we're looking at that R value, when R is larger, uh, so, so basically when R is large, you're looking at a steeper graph. So the bigger the R, the steeper your graph. The smaller the R value, the flatter your graph is. It takes a while, uh, uh, longer to get there. And think of it as a growth rate. If your growth rate is large, your exponential graph is steep. If your growth rate is small, it takes longer to get to there. And so that's basically your main difference there. When R is larger, you get quicker to that ceiling. I hope that makes sense. Have a good day.